Bass, Alabama is where I was born and raised. And I've been listening to all these people tell stories and do interviews about Dogman. Somehow, in every story and every encounter, they have them painted as the bad guy and these evil beings. Now, that's something I know for a fact not to be true. Understand, if you run into one of them while they're hungry or you piss them off, yeah, they're a bit evil and vengeful. But truthfully, if you see a 12-foot tall walking wolf and decide that it's in your best interest to quit it, as my Uncle Duffy would say, you gotta pay the bill, cause your wallet ain't got no money. I had my first dog man encounter on Uncle Duffy's property near the Tennessee border when I was 17 years old. Duffy told me I could hunt the land, but if I found myself in the area where there were old hollowed out trees, no matter how big the deer was, don't shoot it, and leave the area immediately. And that was the second time my Uncle Duffy mentioned to me the beast of the hollow trees. The first time he mentioned the beast of the hollow trees, he was sharing a story with me about how he went hunting and he was over in that area and he took a deer. He's tracking the deer down and goes into this area of his property with, with these huge, massive, hollowed out trees. And as he's moving along, out steps this gigantic, upright walking wolf. Uncle Duffy said it had to be 13 feet tall. And the only reason why he was able to escape that situation was because he noticed that that wolf was eyeballing his rifle. So he laid it on the ground, put his hands up in the air, and backed out of there and then let him be. Well, I'm 17 years old, young, dumb, full of cum. I'm out there and I see a five-point buck. So I take the shot. And now I'm tracking him down. Now, in the back of my mind, the whole hollow tree incident is there, but I had been out a couple of times and I never ran into no area with no hollow trees. And that was until that day because I followed the blood trail of that deer and it led me straight into this area of the woods with these massive, I mean massive trees. The trunk of these trees were literally the size of an 18-wheeler big rig. However, from the angle that I'm walking, I can't tell that they're hollowed out inside. So I keep walking. I'm not directly in the midst of these trees. I'm kind of on the outskirts of them. There to my right, I'm walking in the woods to the left of them. I had been moving along about another 40 or 50 yards through those woods. And my vantage point changed. And I can now see that these gigantic trees are hollowed out. And I'm saying to myself, oh shit. I am in the wrong area. Now mind you, part of me did not believe what Uncle Duffy said about the beast of the hollow out trees. Mainly because Uncle Duffy made moonshine and he would get a little too drunk on his own damn moonshine. However, finding myself facing the reality that at least the trees do exist and not wanting to take a chance of running into the beast, I say to myself, you know what? We're going to have to chalk this deer up as a loss and get the hell out of here. I'm not sure if it was there watching me the whole time or if it just moved in silence and came up on me, but I hear movement ahead of me. And you know how your eyes have to adjust to the woods, like to the foliage, the trees, the leaves, the colors, the sunlight patterns that are coming through. Well, when I hear moving, my eyes lock in that direction, and I can see what probably or possibly had already been there, and I just hadn't recognized it. It's hard to explain that part, but boy, once you see, you can never, ever unsee something like this, because it's a rib cage. That's what my eyes see, a rib cage through the foliage. Standing there, you can see it inflate and deflate with every breath. At 17 years old, I'm six foot two. That rib cage was above my head, six foot seven. And when my eyes trace upward, I see the head, good God almighty. Now, I've heard everybody's description of Dog Man, but the beast of the hollow trees, I know exactly what it looks like. Because when I first saw the movie Underworld, I say to myself, these people in Hollywood must have traveled to Alabama to take photos or to model the werewolf after this thing. Because it looks exactly like the wolf in the underworld, the brother who was locked in the cage. Remember that long snout, those piercing yellow eyes. It looked exactly like him, but it wasn't white. It was black and gray. Now, listen, I don't mean to harp on this, but I think it's important for anybody who spends significant amount of time out in the woods that you understand this. Your eyes have to be able to register this because they can be right there in front of you and you won't see them. But once my eyes actually registered what I was seeing, I ain't gonna lie, the panic kicked in. And I remember what my Uncle Duffy told me in that story about how he saw the beast and how he laid the rifle down. 
Understand, this thing is about 40 yards away from me. It's close enough that if it wanted to run after me and get me, it could. And judging by the size of what I was seeing, my little rifle wasn't about to do anything. So it left me no other choice but to raise the rifle in the air and say out loud, Hey, listen, I'm sorry. I did not mean to trespass on your land. And I laid that rifle down and slowly, when I say slowly, slowly backed out of there, keeping my eyes on it. Now, when I get back to Uncle Duffy's house and I walk in without my rifle, he immediately knew what the hell happened. But I go on and explain it all to him anyway. And that was the last time I was allowed to hunt his land. He said he couldn't take the risk of someone provoking it and it attacking our bloodline again. When I asked him what he meant by risk and attacking our bloodline again, he refused to talk about it. Time passed when I was 23 years old, my Uncle Duffy passed away. Why? Because moonshine turns out not to be too good for your liver and your kidneys. I never got an understanding of what he meant, but his property is still in the family. And when I asked my parents about going there to hunt it, they said it was in his will that no one in the family could hunt his land. He didn't even want you taking shots at deers through the windows. As of today, my cousin lives there. And he does nothing but drink beer and watch TV. I don't even know if he understands what the hell lives on that property. Listen, I wasn't interested in dog, man. Didn't even know they existed. Didn't care to know stuff like that was real. Then I saw one and realized the world is all lies. You can say back then I was a normie, but now my eyes are open and boy can I see. This happened last year during the whole beer virus and circus. It's the anniversary of my mom's death and I wanted to lay a reef at her grave. But here in upstate New York, they was tripping hard. Damn, they're saying you couldn't even leave your house. And on top of that, they had this snitch program in our neighborhood. And I swear to you, I would never, ever would have believed that my neighbors would tell on each other the way they did. One guy gave his son a birthday party in his own backyard. And some bastard called the police. Pissed off half the block because it was none of that person's business what he did in his own backyard. But why am I telling you this? You lived through this with me. The lesson I learned from all of that crap that happened... That people ain't shit. Cowards, the whole lot of them. You tell them the sky's falling and the only way to protect yourself is to hide under a garbage bag, and these dumb bastards would do it. I'm sorry, let me get back to the story. I'm headed to visit my mom's grave, and I leave early in the morning because my office is forcing us to work from home. Last week, I did all of my work for the month, so I head out to the cemetery early. When I get there, the gate is locked, which didn't make no sense because the place should have been open. But upon further inspection, there's a sign saying due to the bear virus, the hours have changed. Now that really pissed me off, so I jumped the gate and went to lay the reef on my mother's grave. I was sitting there talking to my mom, saying, I'm so glad you are not here to deal with all this bullshit. And I'm telling her everything that's going on. When I get the feeling, I'm being watched. But it's a cemetery, so I just brush it off. Now I'm laying on the grass next to her grave, just talking my heart out, and I start to hear something moving about 40 yards away from me in the woods. Understand, the back side of the cemetery leads to a river, so I'm thinking it's just wild game, right? I chill there for another 30 minutes, and when I finally get up, I'm dusting the dust off my mother's tombstone, and I glance over at the wood line, and it's the biggest black dog i ever seen sitting there. Literally, a super muscular Doberman pincher. Way bigger than a dog is supposed to be. I'm 5 foot 10 inches and sitting down this dog is as tall as me. It's looking and watching me. It scares me so much I say, Jesus, you're a big boy. Well, I'm leaving now. Just came to visit my mother. I slowly back away. But what I thought was weird 
is the expression on this animal's face. It was almost as if it could tell I was in pain because it had that look of sympathy on its face. You know how your dog looks when it's worried about you. It had that exact same look on its face. It watches me, then gets up and trots back into the woods. And listen, from behind, it's all shoulders. I'm talking about prehistoric monster muscle. But it was cool, didn't bother me one bit. Now, of course, I'm not trying to bump into nothing like that on a dark, deserted roadway. Hell, I'd rather not bump into that ever again. But every time I listen to one of these dogman encounters, people are acting like these things are raving lunatics. And that just wasn't my experience. And I wanted to say that. To the story. My family has been in the business of crop dusting for three generations. Lost my uncle in an accident. He misjudged how high a high voltage power line was. Ended up hitting that power line, tumbling and exploding and dying. And this business is how we fed our family for years. So naturally, when I was of age, I started working a family business. And my presence allowed us to take on more and more clients. Well, this day I'm working these cornfields. And at this point in time, the worst I had seen was some teenagers naked in the fields doing what they do. But nothing paranormal or odd had ever happened. That was until this day. I'm dusting the crops. I make my first pass, pull up and swing back around to make a second pass on the other side of the field. Now, on this section of the field, the corn stalks are higher. And as I'm lining up, it looks like something is running through the field. Crossways, not down the roads, but across. I can't really tell what it is, but it's big. And so instead of flying super low, and by low I mean wheels right over the top of the stalks, I fly about 25 feet above those stalks to get a look, and I angle myself to where I'm going to intersect and fly over this thing. I'm coming in, and this werewolf, I mean it literally looks like a werewolf, jumps up off the ground like it's trying to bite the propeller. Now I'm guessing that it was smart enough to realize that it was going to die, because I watched duck its head down in midair as I pull up, pull up higher and swing to the right away from it now listen by the time i swing back around i'm doing my best to keep my eyes on this thing leveling back off going in that direction to take a closer look it's completely cleared the cornfield it's done run to the edge of the trees and it's just standing there on two legs watching me that was terrifying but here's the crazy part of the story so i get home i tell my father what i saw and he explains to me that that's one of the wolfmen who come up from Mexico. They migrate north, and this is their migrating season. And that I need to be mindful, because they will take a plane out of the sky like they did my uncle. Understand my entire life, I thought my uncle just misjudged and hit a power line. But no, the way my father explained it to me, his brother was a master at doing this. And the only reason why he slammed into that power line is because... Because one of these creatures clipped the wing of his plane, forcing him to spiral out of control. And that's when he hit the power line, hit the ground, and exploded. Now, I'm still a part of the family business, and I still fly the planes. But, but, but. But now, when August and September roll around, I keep a special eye open. Because these things are real, man. Everybody knows someone, a family member or a friend who's drug dependent. And it doesn't matter. They can be addicted to Vicodin, weed, crack, cocaine, heroin. It's actually a part of life. People do drugs. Well, I took a job at this nonprofit. Part of that job was checking up on drug users who had visited our rehab program. You see, the organization had been given $10 million in federal grants to see to the needs of these addicted people. And a part of that program involved getting the person into the door to our meetings. Then they were funneled into rehab, and once out of rehab, we provided housing and job placement. Well, naturally, this program attracted some very, very hard drug users, heroin addicts, 
and our success rate was pretty good. We're talking about a 45% success rate. Now, specifically, my job was tracking the people who were successful and getting off of drugs and helping them work their way back into society. Well, at the time I had this dog man encounter, I was monitoring 15 clients and everyone was cooperative except for Mr. Anderson. The man just didn't like me. And I know this to be a fact because he told me himself that he did not like me the day I was setting up his housing in Day Branch, Georgia, right outside of Macon. Well, get this, it's time for me to visit Mr. Anderson's house do a walkthrough and just check to see if there's any drug paraphernalia, anything like that. Because according to the program guidelines, if it was discovered that you were using any type of drugs, you were kicked out of the housing and kicked out of the program. But because this man was always so mean, rude and nasty, I would save him for my last stop. And typically this is how my visits with him went. I would arrive at the house, knock on the door, he'd open it and insult me calling me an errand boy and telling me that I'm looking to run back to mommy and tell on him. Talked about mommy, he was referring to the doctor that was the head of the program, Dr. Banfield. And he was right, Dr. Banfield did play the role of mother to this band of drug addict misfits. Well, I pull up to the house in Mr. Anderson's little beat up brown kidnapper van, it's not there. So I decide to wait for him to get home. It's 3.30 p.m. I parked up on the road waiting. I wait for a solid hour. The man doesn't show up. He knows that today I'm coming to do my inspection. So I leave him a note telling him to call me. I'm going to get something to eat and I'll swing back. While I leave his residence, drive to the nearest McDonald's and as soon as I'm in line, so I grab me a soda, fries and head back to the house. When I get there, his brown kidnapper van is there parked under the carport. It's dark outside, so I pull up in the driveway, hop out, and knock on the door. No answer, so I knock again, and no answer. Like I said, this man doesn't like me at all, and I'm feeling like he's messing with me. So I go back to the car and start blowing the horn. I hit that horn three times. Pom, pom, pom. That's when he comes to the door with no shirt on, tidy whities and socks. And he's screaming at me, what the hell are you doing? I tell him, listen, Mr. Anderson, you know I have to do this walkthrough. I don't know why you always giving me shit. You're not answering the door. So I went and I blew the horn to make sure you knew that I was out here. That's when he fires back at me saying, man, I was taking a shit, but you can't be out here near these woods making all that noise. Come inside. So I go inside the house, start my walkthrough, doing my inspection, looking for any signs that he may be using. Understand, heroin addicts tend to be really, really messy. Borderline hoarders because they spend all of their time using drugs and getting money for drugs. Real heroin addicts like Mr. Anderson, their entire day revolves around being high and getting high but walking into this place it's clean i mean super clean you can eat off the floor we're inside for about 10 15 minutes sit down at the table i'm filling out a form for my visit so i can get his signature when wham you hear what sounds like someone beating on his van outside and his reaction gave me the heebie-jeebies because he hops up with fear in his eyes and starts pacing back and forth like a wild man saying i knew that thing heard you you stupid bastard now it's outside imagine the scene i'm sitting at the table watching him move back and forth like a crazy man and say what do you mean by it but he's not responding just going around the house turning off all the lights we hear it beating on his van again then the alarm goes off on my car now pause right here i told y'all this man didn't like me so I'm thinking this whole thing is like an elaborate hoax or plan just to put me to stop me from coming over to his house. But that's not an option. This is what I get paid to do. So the car alarm is still going off. So I get up, walking towards the front door, open it. And he says, if I were you, I wouldn't go outside. I would wait until it leaves. And I tell him, Mr. Anderson, you play way too many games. I'm going outside to see what's going on with my car and I'll be right back. So I open that front door and click on his porch light halfway out of the door looking over at my car and there is this dog head you know the child child dogs the big furry dogs well this thing is puffy and furry like a child child it's on the other side of my car but it's standing up all i remember was this gigantic snout and those teeth i'm pretty sure there was some kind of eye shine and primarily those gigantic teeth that were caught my eyes and I froze out of fear. Next, I remember him pulling me back into the house, closing the door and just standing there as he paced back and forth saying, I don't have a gun, I don't have a rifle. If it comes in here, we're dead. Listen, for the next four hours, the two of us sat in the dark being terrorized as this thing beat on the van, set off my car alarm, stalked around the house, tapping on windows, scratching on doors, even jiggled the back freaking door handle then it just stops like something or someone called it off 
But everything stops and he says, listen, if you want to leave, you need to leave now. So I run straight out the door, hop into my car and leave. The next morning, I'm at the office and I'm still shook up over what I saw and cannot believe he's living with a monster coming to his house like that. So I call him and I say, listen, Mr. Anderson, I know we really don't like each other, but you probably shouldn't be living with that thing around you. Last night was terrifying. And he goes on to tell me that when he first moved into that house, he would sit outside on the porch at night and smoke cigarettes. And this thing came running up the middle of the road, chasing a deer swipes at the deer's hind legs knocks it to the ground bites it on the neck and then runs off with it into the woods and since he's been living there he has seen that same thing 18 times look i didn't like mr anderson just as much as he didn't like me but i couldn't have that man living in that kind of situation so I offer for him to move. We had just got another house and I felt like the situation he was in was way too dangerous. Well, he agrees and I tell him to come over the next day to get the keys. The following day, Mr. Anderson gets his new set of keys and over the next week, he moves into that new house. Well, to this day, I still beat myself up over this, but honestly, it's not my fault. He's a grown man and he made his own decisions, but I should have done an inspection as soon as he moved into that house. Well, I fi but I figured the man had been through enough with a freaking monster outside his other house. He just needed some peace and quiet, right? So I skipped the first inspection. The second week rolls around. I go to the house for the inspection. I knock on the door. There's no answer. I beat on the door. There's no answer. The van is there. He should be there. So now I'm circling around the house, looking through the windows. And when I get to the back window, which looks into the kitchen, Mr. Anderson is there, slumped over in a chair, dead with a freaking needle in his arm. When I tell you, this was one of the saddest days of my life, for real, I thought I was protecting him. But as soon as he got comfortable, he went back to using drugs again. Listen to me when I say to you that I regret moving him because part of me believes that he was in such a state of fear and terror with that monster outside of the house that he couldn't get high. He knew he couldn't get high. But the minute he got to a place where he could let his guard down and relax, he started using drugs again. Now get this, we tried to put another client into his old house. The lady moved out on her second night, said it was too much weird shit happening and that she'd rather live on the streets than live there. The person after her moved into the house and then moved out a week later without telling us anything. Eventually, we had no choice but to stop renting that place out and we sold it for a $5,000 loss just to get rid of it. 